Did everything just taste purple for a second? I just said, yes, ma'am, I mean, anything. Today, we're going to make, ow. <laughs> Shit. Today, we're going to make shochu. It's a traditional Japanese spirit made from rice or barley or, more interestingly, sweet potatoes. Shochu making uses parallel fermentation. So you've got your koji and you've got your yeast. The koji takes place of malt and breaks down the starches into sugars and then the yeast breaks the sugars into alcohol and CO2. I did the same process in my uh, Chinese baiju video and I'll put a link for that right up here if you wanna check it out. So let's just jump right into this, shall we? Now, before we could do anything with sweet potatoes, we've actually gotta make a starter culture for our mold and our yeast using rice as a base. So it's a two-stage process. Here's part one. First off, you need five pounds, this is a little more than five pounds, of short grain rice. And the reason why you want short grain as opposed to medium or long is because it packs in a lot more starch. And more starch means more potential sugars, which means more alcohol. So you just weigh out your rice, dump it into a pot or a bucket, and get it soaking overnight for at least 12 hours. And then you drain off the water and steam the rice. Now, I like to use a grain bag and my big old tamale pot with a false bottom in it, and it's a good idea to steam it for at least an hour. And since we're not using malt to convert the starches into sugars, we have to use another source for those amylase enzymes to get that conversion power. Otherwise, the yeast that we're going to add later won't have any sugar to convert into alcohol, and that would suck. So that's where the koji mold that we're going to use comes into play. Sweet potato shochu uses a different kind of koji mold than is normally used in like sake brewing or even all grain shochu brewing. Normally they use aspergillus orze, which is a white koji mold. In the sweet potato version of shochu, they traditionally use something called aspergillus awamori. That one's a type of black koji, which I could not find. Um, there was just nowhere that I could get it for any sort of reasonable time frame or price. So what I ended up going with was Aspergillus lucensis. And it's basically the same thing as the Awamori. It's another form of the black koji mold, but it's actually kind of brownish. But, you know, it's basically the same thing according to the internet. The most important thing is that it has one characteristic that we really, really need that kind of sets this koji strain apart from any other. It produces citric acid while it's digesting those starches into sugars and that is a very good thing. The citric acid has two really good benefits to it. One is that it creates a hostile environment for bacterial infection. So you're much less likely to get a bacterial infection in your fermentation, which is awesome because this stuff is prone to that. So having this little extra characteristic is really beneficial. And the other thing is that those acids it produces are actually gonna help you during distillation, hypothetically, because acids tend to turn into esters when they go through distillation. And the esters are flavor compounds and all kind of good things. The only place I could find this stuff easily was fermentationculture.eu. If you find another source for this one or the Aspergillus awamori, go ahead and put those links down in the comments section down below because I know it's gonna help me and anybody else that's looking for this stuff. I'm recommending them simply because I, I purchased some of their product and I tried it. They are not a sponsor of the channel. However, into the AM, is the sponsor of today's video. So if you don't know Into the AM, they make some of the coolest graphic t-shirts I've ever seen. And I don't know how they do it, but these are the softest, most comfortable shirts I've ever worn. They've got tons of different designs and they're coming out with new stuff all the time. And coming up right now, they've got a whole bunch of tank tops and stuff like that that you can get that also have cool graphics on them. Now I've lost enough weight that I think I could actually possibly, maybe, perhaps, pull off a tank top. So I'm looking at this one right here. So if you're interested in getting some Into the AM t-shirts, make sure that you use the link that I've got down in the video description and the coupon code that goes with it so you can get a very nice discount on everything that you purchase. Okay, so back to the spores. The sample is pretty small. It's only like 1.75 grams, but it's enough to do about 10 pounds of material. But in order to get that to spread and, and mix thoroughly into your fermentation, you got to prepare it. So to do that, we need to make a sanitary substrate so that this will spread further. 
and mix in properly. So all we need is a half a cup of flour, just regular old wheat flour. You're gonna heat that up on like medium heat in a dry saute pan. And basically what you're trying to do is sterilize it. And so you're just gonna bring it up to heat uh, nice and slow, you're not trying to cook it. And once you can start to smell kind of a little toastiness to it, that's basically done, it's hot enough. So turn off the heat, throw a lid on it, and let that cool down to room temperature before you do anything else. It needs to be cool. These are living mold spores, so if you just throw them in hot, it's gonna kill them and you've just wasted your time. So let that cool down. And once your flour is cool, you mix in your spores really thoroughly, then just cover that back up and let that sit until your rice is done. Once your rice is finished steaming, then you're just gonna dump that into your fermenter, cover it up, and let that cool down to room temperature as well. So like 75 to 80 degrees Fahrenheit Celsius. So once that's cooled down, take your spore flour mixture and just start mixing that in to your rice as thoroughly as you can and then cover it up and then we move on to the next part. The tricky part is keeping that rice humid enough and warm enough so that the spores can actually propagate and grow. I had a little trouble with this. There are a couple of different methods to keep your stuff nice and warm. Some people actually build boxes to you know, grow koji when they're doing it a lot. Basically what you need is kind of a hot box something that's gonna keep a, a regulated temperature and a regulated humidity. So I kind of cheated a little bit. Here's what I did. I have a heating pad, threw that down into my ice chest. I put all my rice into one of these guys and I just kept it covered. Put that into my ice chest so it holds the heat in. And then I've got one of these uh, temperature regulators with a thermal probe on it. This one's a little old school, it's not my favorite. I think the Inkbird ones do a little bit better. I'll put a link to those down in the video description if you wanna check them out. If you don't have one for home brewing, you should probably get one because it helps you to maintain temperatures for like lagering or for stuff like this. Basically, you set in your temperature and then you plug your heat source or your refrigerator, whether you're doing hot or cold, you plug that into this guy and it turns on and off to regulate the temperature. Pretty simple. So I threw my rice with the mold spores in here, set my temperature for 95 degrees, then I just covered it up and I let it go. And the first day it really didn't do very much. The temperature was like 75 or 85 degrees Fahrenheit. And I was kind of getting worried, like, I don't know if this is gonna warm up fast enough. It was working, I mean, it was turning the, the heating pad on very frequently to uh, bring that temperature up, but uh, it was just taking a little while, and so I went to work. And then when I came home, it was 110 degrees, 110 Fahrenheit. That is way outside the safety margin for this stuff, where this stuff is happy. I was a little concerned that the, the spores were dead. So I took the cover off, I stirred that rice around like crazy to pull some of the heat out of it and to to get it to kind of calm down. Sorry, I didn't I didn't take any camera footage of that. I was freaking out too much. Then I just took it out of that setup and I set it right here on the stove so that there would be some airflow underneath and it wouldn't be able to retain any heat inside that hot box. 12 hours later it was back up to 108. So it was just kind of a runaway reaction. And it was kind of freaking me out and then I realized what I did wrong. Whenever you're propagating koji, the best thing you can do is to keep your, your grain bed only about two inches deep. Much more than that, and you've got a lot of mass in there that once it gets hot and once it starts going, it's just kind of like a freight train. I had about four and a half, five inches in here and that is way too much. So the best thing I could have done was like set up two of these hot boxes for that five pounds of rice. That way it'd keep the grain bed nice and thin and it would have a much more stable temperature without the runaway train. If you have one of these temperature regulators, uh, set up your trays and stick them in an old fridge and put a lamp in there with an old school light bulb and close it up and that's gonna do the same thing. It's, it's gonna create a heat source 
that just turns on and then turns off when it hits the right temperature. Just make sure that your temperature probe guy is down inside your grain bed so that you're getting an accurate read of what the real temperature is, not the ambient temperature in that box. So uh, you only need to do that for like two to three days. Basically what you're looking for is something kind of like this. You want to get a little bit of the brown uh, mold actually growing on the top, but mostly just kind of a fuzzy white coating on the rice. If you want to propagate some of this to uh, use for another batch, let it go brown all the way across the top and then scoop off that mold and freeze it. That's what I did. I have some in my freezer right now so I can use for a future batch. Once you get to that point, then you just need to stop the reaction so that you can move on to the next stage. And the easiest way to do that is just throw this back into your fermenter and add some water. The ratio that I recommend is five pounds of rice to one gallon of water. So throw those together and it's just room temperature water. That's gonna really slow down the whole mold propagation process because it, it prefers it to be a drier environment. It likes humidity, but it doesn't like to drown. At that point, it's gonna already have produced most of the enzymes that it needs to do all the work that we're gonna need for the rest of the fermentation. So once you get the water in there, you're gonna go ahead and throw in your yeast. Now's the time when we start that parallel fermentation. And I just used a couple tablespoons of uh, DADY, some good old daddy yeast. So once you get that yeast in there, it's all broken up. You wanna stir that once a day and give it about five to six days to fully ferment. Because what you're doing is you're actually making a giant starter culture for when you add your sweet potatoes. So I was lucky. I ended up having a really good sweet potato harvest from my garden. So I spent an hour or two and dug all those up. If you don't have a garden out in the back with a bunch of sweet potatoes, just go pick them up from the grocery store. And I'm using purple sweet potatoes because that's what I had and that's what's most traditional for what they're doing in Japan. Granted, it's a different species of purple sweet potato, but there's like 90 of those, so, you know, no big. So my ratio for sweet potatoes and water is about 20 pounds of sweet potatoes, this much in kilograms, to four gallons of water, this many liters. That's gonna give you about six to 7% ABV when this is totally done, and that's usually what they're going for. Uh, if you want a higher yield of alcohol, you can increase the amount of sweet potatoes and just leave your water the same. And uh, I chose to boil my sweet potatoes because I kind of wanted to just get the raw ingredient flavor without doing anything else, but you can steam them or you can roast them. Once your sweet potatoes are completely boiled, you want to blend them up. And I've got a stick blender. Just stick that down in the pot and blend them up until they are smooth, smooth, smooth. This will come back to haunt you if you don't do that. So once they're all cooked, they're all blended up, just let that cool down again to about 75 or 80 degrees Fahrenheit, nice and cool. And then you're just gonna dump that in with your rice starter. And Again, you're gonna stir it once a day, every day, for about nine or 10 days. That's traditional. Mine actually finished in about four or five days though. But I wanted to make sure that I gave it the full amount of time, so I went ahead and kept stirring it every day for nine whole days. With this type of fermentation, since you don't have like a starting ABV, because you weren't converting everything all at once at the beginning so you know your starting gravity, that's the challenge with parallel fermentations. The easiest way to know whether or not this is really done is to do an iodine test. Basically, you use the iodine to make sure that every bit of starch is fully converted, and if it's fully converted and your yeast is still alive, then all the sugars that have been released from those starches are gonna be turned into alcohol. To my mind, that's the easiest way to make sure that you're absolutely done. So what I did is I took a sample of my mash, I got some of the clear liquid, I got some of the rice bits, and I even got a chunk of solid sweet potato. And as you can see from this reaction, the only thing that still turned black was that chunk of unblended sweet potato. Now luckily there were only a few chunks in there, mostly it was just pulp. Because there were just a few chunks of potato in there, I wasn't really worried about it, so I just said fuck it and sent it to the liquor ferry. 
all I did was strain it through a mesh bag. Just scoop it a time, strained it through a mesh bag, and then I put it back in my fermenter and I let it settle. Now, as you can see, mine didn't settle completely. I've got a kind of a 50-50 mix of clear wash and then this thick sediment down at the bottom. My recommendation, if you've got the time and you got a little extra cash, is to get a product called Super Clear. It's a two-stage process. It's, a, it's like two little liquid packets. You mix in one, give it an hour, and mix in another one, and let it sit for 24 hours, and it'll drop 99% of everything in that wash all the way out. And it'll just be a nice thin layer down on the bottom instead of three or four inches of wasted space. Since I didn't do that, I put a whole bunch of that sediment into the thumper and sent that to the liquor ferry and the clear wash, I just put that in the boiler and I sent that off to the liquor ferry so they could run it all through and, and have maximum extraction of flavor and alcohol, hypothetically speaking. So it was a weird run. It was a very weird run. You know, I got back together with the liquor ferry and they brought me all the jars and it was really tailsy in the heads. In the heads. And I was like, dude, was this going bonkers and boiling. No, it was, a, it was a low and slow run from what I understand. So I was not happy with that. So I gave all the jars back to the liquor ferry and they still had the wash. So they just put it all back in and ran it even slower. And still early tails, not quite as early, but still early. Um, there was almost no hearts. It was just all contaminated. They brought me back all the jars and I just treated them as if that was a stripping run. Because this was a really low yield batch, um, you know, six or seven percent ABV and, you know, your, your total yield is pretty small. Uh, there was only about uh, three and a half liters of low wines from that stripping run. And so it was perfect to put into the mini still. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, link to this video right up here. So I sent that off to the liquor ferry and said, run this as slow as you possibly can. So they did. And what I got back was better, much, much better. Here's the confusing part that may confuse your senses. If you try this, Koji mold has kind of a blue cheesy funk kind of character to it. As it's growing, it's like it's mushroomy and earthy and it's got a kind of a funk that if you know what tails smell like, it's kind of slightly reminiscent, just a little bit, you know? So that funk kind of confuses the palate a little bit. My recommendation is when you do something like this, that you do that airing out process where you set out your jars, put some paper towels over them and let them sit and air out overnight so that you can get the flavors to kind of balance because right off the still this stuff is going to smell really funky and, and it's going to it's going to be really hard to make the cuts once you let it air out it's going to make more sense and you'll be able to find the transitions a little bit easier before we get to the tasting i just want to say a huge huge thank you to all of my patreons i had a massive computer failure last week i sent a message to my patreons to let them know what was going on so they wouldn't you know be like ah oh, there's Bearded taking another month off. It was amazing how supportive and understanding and helpful you guys were. I really appreciate all your support. And uh, I also want to say a massive, massive thank you to Glenn. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Because Glenn is a superhero and he saved the day. And uh, he is a family friend and kind of an unofficial patron of the channel. And uh, he found out what was going on and swooped in and saved the day. So thank you very much, Glenn. I am <coughs> truly grateful. Thank you. One other thing for my Patreons, got a couple extra of the uh, Into the AM t-shirts. So I'm gonna post a little thing over on my Patreon page to give them away to you guys because you're amazing and you're keeping my lights on. All right, so let's get on to the tasting. All right, so we ended up with about a liter of product at 42%, and it's definitely got a, a very sweet nose to it. It's almost fruity or candy-like. It's hard to describe. 
it does smell a little earthy, like uh, sweet potatoes, but it's hard to pick out. Like if you didn't tell me what it was, I'm not sure I'd be able to guess. Super clean. Yeah, it's got a soft mouth feel to it. A little bit of astringency there, which is interesting. It's got a little bit of that kind of funk. If you haven't grown koji before, then it's gonna be hard to describe. It's really faint in the distillate, but it's definitely there. So it kind of confuses you into thinking that it's all tails, but it's really not. This is different because there's a nuttiness in it that you get from uh, mold fermented products like miso. So yeah, there's this slight funky earthy nuttiness to it that I kind of dig. I would almost want to age this on like walnut or pecan. Yeah. Yeah. First, first impression on the tongue as it washes across is very, very clean. But then you get that little bit of a, uh, astringency on the sides of the tongue some definite sweetness all the way throughout and the retro nasal when you breathe out through your nose after you've swallowed that's when you get that kind of nutty funkiness i would say this is one of the most challenging spirits uh, that i've come across and part of that is because of the classification like where does this sit um, some people put it between like a whiskey and a vodka. I disagree completely. I would, I would put this closer to uh, tequila. Uh, just because there's so much weird stuff going on along with the sweet roastiness of it. And I think there's a lot of room to play around with this. All I did was boil these. I kind of want to try this again, but with a much denser ratio of sweet potato to water just so that we can find out, one, what happens when you get a bigger yield. Do you still get that weird tails thing kind of chasing you all the way through? But two, uh, I want to experiment and roast these things and then ferment them and see what happens. I think that would give us a really cool flavor. I think that would add to the sweet character, but it also may add some different layers because one of the things that I've read about is that roasted agave like fresh roasted agave piñas smell like sweet potatoes. So I'm wondering if we get these roasted, would we get something even closer to a tequila? Uh, because right now, this is kind of what this reminds me of. So is this a easy to approach spirit? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, just, a, it's just a clean white spirit with a little bit of sweetness to it. But all these other interesting characteristics, I think, lend themselves to further experimentation and this is an it's an outlier spirit it's a weird one that I think you know if you're if you're in this hobby because you like doing weird stuff then this is definitely something you should try I know this is kind of a this is kind of a weird project but you know that's why I like doing them because I've never done it and very few people online have actually talked about doing something like this and I'm really glad I did because now we have at least one data point to look at if anybody wants to do it in the future. So I'm gonna add this to my international regional spirits collection. I think it's pretty awesome that I now have a Baiju, a Pachin, this Japanese Shochu, a Croatian Plum Brandy. So if you're interested in those kinds of things and you haven't seen them, go ahead and check out my international spirits playlist right up here. So check out my recipe down in the video description if you wanna use that as your base. Hi. It's okay. I'm just filming in the, the main thoroughfare of our home, so it's <laughs> totally okay. <laughs> All right, so if you enjoyed this project, if you thought it was interesting, you learned something, do me a favor and hit the like button because after all the challenges of this recipe, I really could use it. If you uh, want to see what I'm going to do next time, which I guarantee it's going to be very cool, do yourself a favor, do me a favor, do us both a favor and hit the subscribe button and then hit the little bell icon right next to it so you can get notified when I post new content. If you have any questions or comments about this video, do me a favor and post those in the comment section down below. Hey, I like your shirt. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. If you want to get a shirt like this, check them out down in the uh, top comment or in the video description right down below. All right, thanks for watching. Talk at you later.